invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. Try not to scroll your eyes down to see how many verses there are in Genesis 24. (laughs) Question as we begin. Is your faith contagious as a cold? This morning. We're going to look at a narrative in the life of Abraham that highlights a man that's not even given a name. I call him Saint No Name. He probably most likely has a name. This could very well be uh, Eleazar. But for whatever reason, his name is not even given in this passage. And yet what is displayed here, perhaps even more important than the author even giving his name, is his faith. And how his faith is described. That is a faith of Abraham's trusted and faithful servant. The series we're starting this morning is called Contagious Faith. What are those, some of the marks that make our faith contagious to others? It's the faith of Abraham's servant. And we'll see why that's important to Abraham and why it's important for us today. Now this passage is 67 verses today, so put your seatbelt on. <laughs> we're going to go for a ride. Look with me at verses 1 through 10. And we might interrupt uh, these verses from time to time. Verses Uh, 1 through 4 to start of Genesis chapter 24. Abraham was now old, getting on in years, and the Lord had blessed him with everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household who managed all that he owned, place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to the land and my family, and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Okay, let's, uh, we'll stop there. Let's just take a couple of things and keep in mind here. First, a small point, but as we read at the very beginning of this verse, it says Abraham is getting old. But look how he's described. This version says uh, he's getting on in years. He's getting on in years. Uh, now, if you have a, a similar context, um, a similar version, the New American Standard, it, it actually uh, thinks very highly of, of Abraham when it says he was old, he was advanced in age. Isn't that a nice way of putting it, you know, being old? He was advanced in age. Doesn't that sound respectful? It sounds esteeming, you know. Uh, I'm not old, I'm advanced. That's how you can respond. You know, you can tell the translator, of the, well, at least the New American Standard, respected the elderly. But who's the one who translated the KJV? If you had the KJV in front of you, what does it say? What's that? Very old and? Stricken with age. Yeah. Yeah. He was old. He was stricken with age. It's like saying, hey, your life's over, old man. Give it up. Really? Regardless, Abraham is old. And we are told that the Lord has blessed him in everything. We know that Abraham has acquired a great wealth, a large group of people with him, a large group of livestock, and yet there's only one thing he doesn't have a large supply of in abundance, and that is his own descendants. He has Isaac, and you know he's got Ishmael and a few others here and there, but Isaac has no wife. That's the whole problem here. He wants a wife for Isaac. And now after the death of his wife, Sarah, uh, his son Isaac is feeling somewhat lonely, somewhat sad. Uh, And even though Abraham has been richly blessed, he's not been able to find a wife for his son. So he turns to his his truest and faithful 
uh, his eldest servant, uh, servant no name, Saint no name. And he says, uh, as we read on here, he commissions him, takes an oath uh, for him to go find a wife for Isaac. Now, you might not be comfortable with the, the way that they take oaths here, but uh, it's very uh, popular here in the Old Testament, we see in Genesis at least, for someone making an oath to put their hand under someone's thigh and swear an oath for them. Uh, and this particular oath is that it's by the Lord God of heaven, the God of earth, that Abraham's servant would not take a wife for Isaac from the daughters of Canaanite, the Canaanites, uh, where they lived, but instead he would go to the land of Abraham's family. And take a wife from them. But notice in verse 5, the servant has a question. And notice Abraham's response, 5 through 10. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me to the land, to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, Make sure you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give you this land to your offspring. He will send his angel before you, and you can take a wife from my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath, but don't let my son go back there. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. The servant took ten of his master's camels and departed with all kinds of his master's good in hands, and he set out for Nahor's town, Aram Nahirium. Now, there's a particular word that appears some 14 times here in the narrative. Sometimes it's hard to pick up, and that is the word take. The word take, <coughs> in that uh, the servant must take a wife for Isaac. He must take her from Abraham's family. Now, this might sound a little bit like kidnapping here. But it's not. It's a common word for someone finding a spouse. And Abraham is very concerned that a wife not be taken from the Canaanites, but instead taken from his family. In verse 7, he tells his servant why he should take a wife from his family. And that is because when he says, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this offering, this land, to your offspring. In other words, Abraham is thinking about this situation <coughs> like his own situation, that God took Abraham out of the land and blessed him. So too, now, <coughs> he desires that his servant goes and takes a wife for Isaac. Now, we see an example We'll see an example of arranged marriage here in a moment. But notice how the servant and Abraham are so concerned with the willingness of this woman to follow this servant, never, having never even met her future husband. There's no kidnapping here, but they want God to be behind this. If God's not in this, they don't want it. Abraham is so reliant upon God's provision here that he even goes so far to say that God will send his angel before his servant and take a wife for Isaac from there. Who has that type of faith to command heaven to send an angel before them to work and provide for them? As he says, he will send an angel. He's not asking. He's saying God will provide. God will provide. If you recall a few chapters back, Genesis 22 when God tested Abraham's faith and told him to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar of Mount Moriah. The place was later named God Will Provide. You don't have to tell Abraham at this point in his life whether or not God cares for the deepest, his deepest needs. Abraham already knows the answer to that. He knows that God will provide. <coughs> Notice verses 11 through 28 as a servant then meets Rebecca. We're going to break it up in verse, uh, verse 14, 11 to 14. So he made the camels kneel beside a well of water outside the town at evening. This was the time when the women went out to draw water. 
the Lord God of my master Abraham, he prayed, give me success today and show kindness to your, my master Abraham. I'm standing here at the spring where the daughters of men of town are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, please lower your water jug so that I may drink. And who responds, drink and I'll water your camels also. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. You know, this could have been a lot easier for Abraham's servant. He could have turned to a dating app, you know, like Christian Mingle to find this girl. He could have, you know, just tuned in to the bachelorette, you know, the uh, girls in, uh, <coughs> in Nahor's town. You know, he could have found any one of the other dating apps instead of making this long trip with all these camels, with this luggage and precious gifts to win this girl over. But instead he takes this somewhat old-fashioned approach of going to the well and asking which girl is going to give him a drink and water all his camels. But also that's not traditional. Instead he's turning though to God's provision as he prays. But notice how specific he is in his prayer to God. And this is again, Abraham's servant is praying to God himself. And he's desiring for God to show kindness to Abraham. He's looking for a sign from above. And he said, when the daughters of the town come out and gather water in their jugs to take back to town, <clears throat> he's going to ask one of them for some water. And he says, if she says yes, and also says, I will water your camels, then he will know that God has appointed this girl for Isaac. Now, easier said than done, right? You know, we're used to watering our chihuahuas here in this country. You know, camels are like elephants. You know, they require some upwards of 25 gallons. And, you know, this is not a test of niceness. You know, did she say good morning to me? Oh, that's the one right there. You know, no. She's going to go out and feed or water 10 camels at at least 25 gallons at a time. You know, there's a rope to pull up the bucket from the well. Then you have to carefully pour it into your jug. And then you're sloshing it around as you're carrying it over to these camels. And the camels are pushing and shoving, just trying to get some water. And you're wasting some of the precious water you work so hard for. All of this at the request of a complete stranger. Who would do such a thing? Notice verse 15. Now read through 21. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, coming with a jug on her shoulder. Now the girl was very beautiful, a young woman who had not known a man intimately. She went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me have a little water for your jug. She replied, Drink, my lord. She quickly lowered her jug into her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels until they've had enough to drink. She quickly emptied her jug into the trough and hurried to the well again to draw water. She drew water for all his camels. While the man silently watched, to see whether or not the Lord had made his journey a success. I can't help but read this phrase, this first phrase, over and over again. Before he had finished praying, there was Rebecca. If you ever doubt that God hears your prayers, you know, sometimes you might be convinced, well, there's maybe a delay between earth and heaven before our prayers get heard. You know, or maybe God is just, yeah, put us on hold. He doesn't want to listen to us right now. Or maybe he says, wait, hold on. I got to take a prayer on another line. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. May this uh, statement encourage us that he listens. He listens. And sometimes he answers even before we're finished praying. He's already at work. Behold, there was Rebecca. And notice we're told exactly who she is before even the servant is. She's the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. Oh, this could be the one. But wait, 
There's more. It says she was very beautiful. And a young woman who has not known a man intimately. She is beautiful and there's uh, no chance that she's been with a man. The last thing that the servant needs to do is to bring home a girl who's already pregnant, present, present her to Isaac. Only to realize that she's carrying not Isaac's offspring, but somebody else's. And here is Rebecca, and how does she respond to the question when he asks her for a drink? She says, My Lord, drink, and I'll draw up water for your camels until they've had enough to drink. Wow, is this really possible? I mean, perhaps he thought, you know, the servant thought, well, this could take a while. You know, perhaps the first two or, or three girls that come forth, I'll ask them if they'll give me a drink and they'll just shut me down. You know, and maybe one will say, well, I'll try. And then, and then she'll water one camel. Then the next one will water a second camel. And he'll be there all afternoon. But no, instead it happens just like that. There is Rebecca. So what does he do while she's <coughs> watering the camels? <clears throat> it says he silently watched to see whether or not God had made his journey a success. I'm sure he's still somewhat in shock that God even answered his prayer that fast and that God would make his journey a success. I'm sure he's surprised that God would watch over him and that he would not come back without a wife for Isaac. You know, it begs the question, is it wrong to pray for success? Is it wrong to ask God for success in your life? Well, what's the opposite of success? Well, it's asking uh, for disdain. It's asking uh, for us to be unsuccessful. Should we ask rather that we are a disdain on society? You know, God, I just want you to let me fail over and over and over again so I can grasp more of the nature of Christ and Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected. Can you just make my life miserable, please? so that I might know more of you and more of Christ. You know, if you were to study medieval spirituality, you might find some similar trends along those lines. But back to the question of success. Success is surrounded by a true heartfelt need, an honest need. When we say, Lord, you know, help me to have a successful church. Help me to have a successful job. It's not quite the same as saying, God, help me to have a successful marriage. Help me to have a successful relationship with my kids. Help me to have a successful relationship with other believers. Does what I'm asking for align with something that God already desires for our life? For this servant, his success depended on God's provision. Notice how it continues. 22. After the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and, uh, for her wrist and two bracelets weighing ten shekels of gold. <coughs> Whose daughter are you? He asked. Please tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who she bore to Nahor. He also said, And we have plenty of straw and feed and a place to spend the night. Then the man bowed down, worshipped the Lord, verse 27, and said, Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and forgiveness from my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on a journey to the house of my master's relatives. The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Notice he gives her a ring even before he asks whose daughter she is. It's like he already knows that God has provided once again for his master, Abraham. And she tells him. But the second question is, does your father have room for him and his caravan to stay the night? And she says, yes. Notice his response in verse 26. He bowed down and worshipped. Notice who he's worshipping. It's not Rebecca. It's the Lord. He says, praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness from my master. As for the Lord has led me on this journey to the house of my master's relative. He is overjoyed. He's ecstatic. God has listened and acted triumphantly, divinely, quickly, beautifully. The job is not quite done, though. 
She or her family have not said yes to anything. The success of the whole trip still lies in the balance. For the sake of time, I'm just going to summarize the next part, and that is verses 29 through 49, where Abraham's servant goes to the family of Rebekah's father, who's not quite involved at all in the exchange. Whether he's present or not, we're not sure. For whatever reason, it's just her brother and mother who interact with this servant. Now he comes back with them, and they give his camels food and straw and something to eat, and they prepare this huge meal before the, the, the servant and his men. But before he eats, he says, let's talk business first. And that is, I've taken an oath from my master Abraham, your relative, that I would find a wife for Isaac, not from the Canaanite women, but from here, from his family. And he described how he went about discovering who it was that God had placed before him as appointed to be the wife of Isaac. And he recounts his prayer and the fact that he was, <clears throat> he recounts before he was even finished, there was Rebecca. And he asked her all these questions about her family and the like. And after the repeated discussion, he asked her about her family. If there were, uh, he goes to his family in verse uh, 49 and ask, if you're going to show faithfulness and kindness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me. He gives them an ultimatum. I need to know right now whether this is going to happen or not. He says, I've been waiting, you know, essentially when waiting patiently until now, I need to know that if I'm wasting my time or if this trip has been a success. Notice though, that he's asking Laban, her brother, and her mother. Can you imagine if a stranger showed up to your house and asked for the hand of your daughter to be wed. And you just told your daughter, well, go into another room and we'll decide your fate. <laughs> I remember doing a small study in college on arranged marriages. I was surprised to realize that the divorce rate amongst arranged marriages, this was a number of years ago, was only 2%. 2% amongst countries with arranged marriages. That's where the <coughs> parents decide which spouse for their child. Compared to American, Amer uh, Americans on dating, uh, which uh, divorce usually ends up uh, around 50% in our country today. It might be uh, here or there a little bit more. But it's drastically different. You know, 2% of divorce rate to 50% in our country. Now, some of this is, you know, chalked up to cultural norms about marriage. Uh, and, but there's, in a sense, there's a family involvement, though, with arranged marriages. Often, we miss that today in our culture, where couples usually don't introduce each other to the families until they're comfortable with their boyfriend or girlfriend, and then the family is introduced. But not here, not arranged marriages. But look at the response <coughs> afterwards. We're going to jump ahead to verse 50 through 61. 50 through 61. Laban and Bethuel answered. They said, this is from the Lord. This is uh, uh, her brother and, and mother. We have no choice in the matter. Rebecca is here in front of you. Take her and go. Let her be a wife for your man's son, just as the Lord has spoken. And when Abraham's servant heard these words, he bowed to the ground before the Lord. Then he brought out objects of silver and gold and garments, gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men with him ate and drank, spent the night. They got up in the morning and said, Send me to my master. But her brother and mother said, Let the girl stay with us for ten days. Then she can go. But he responded to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has made my journey a success, send me away so that I can go to my master. So they said, call, <coughs> let's call the girl and ask her opinion. They called Rebecca and said, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. And then they sent away their sister Rebecca with the one who had nursed and raised her. Abraham's servant said, uh, and his men, then they blessed Rebecca, saying to her, our sister may become more a thousands upon ten thousands. May her offspring possess the gates of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her female servant got up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant took off, took Rebekah, and left. So it sounds like they made the choice for her, her brother and her mother. 
At least we don't hear from Rebecca as much, but still <coughs> hear her willingness to go earlier. When it comes down to it, they asked her if she would like to wait 10 days or go with them the next day. And they even bless her and say, Our sister may become thousands upon ten thousands. May her offspring possess the gate of the enemies. And so she went with them. But look at how all this concludes in the closing, 62 to 67. Isaac was returning from Berlaroi, where he was living in the Negev region. In the early evening, Isaac went out to the field <clears throat> and looked up. He saw camels coming. Verse 64, Rebecca looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? The servant answered, It is my master. So she took the veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, took Rebekah to be his wife. Isaac loved her, and he was comforted after his mother's death. So here we have in closing this great betrothal. Isaac returns, walks out to the field, and saw the camels approaching. Notice Rebekah, she then looks up, and she sees Isaac. Before she knew who he was, before she had got the answer to that question, she got off her camel, asked the servant who told her it was Isaac. So she took a veil and covered her face. Now it seems a little out of place, but in doing so she's symbolizing that she is his bride, veiled for her future husband. She's not going kicking and screaming. How could she love and care for someone that she's never met, though? Well, in her case, God has provided her for Isaac. Who was she to question God? After the servant reports to Isaac about his journey, all that he had done, Isaac takes his wife into the tent of his late mother, Sarah, and they have a private wedding ceremony. Just the two of them. Notice one final phrase, though. It says, Isaac loved her. He was comforted after his mother's death. What a love story. But what a great narrative once more of God's provision for Abraham. You might not have a whirlwind of a love story like Rebecca and Isaac, but you might be in a position today where you too have to rely upon God <clears throat> to provide some resource for you. You're wondering how, how this coming winter you're going to pay the heat bill. Or perhaps you have a surgery coming up. It's something you can't even pay for. Perhaps you need another car and you can't afford it right now. Perhaps you have a major life decision life challenge and you're wondering if God is big enough to provide for your needs. I remember reading the life and ministry of George Mueller and reading how on many mornings the kids and the staff would wake up and there would be no bread, nothing to eat. Instead of just complaining or going throughout the community and scavenging for whatever garbage they could eat, instead the kids and Staff and George Mueller turned to prayer. The orphans, they turned to prayer. And as they were praying, a, a bread truck would break down right outside the door. And they had to get rid of all the contents, all the fresh bread. Plenty for the orphans and the people to eat. God provides for our deepest needs if we have faith that that is dependent completely on him. And often God provides for us <coughs> when we put our unwavering faith in Him for our needs. Sometimes it's not as quick or in the way we often think. I read this story about each morning how a woman walked to her front gate and she shouted, Praise the Lord! And each time she would do so, the atheist next door would yell, There is no Lord! One day she prayed, Lord, I'm hungry. Please send me some food. 
The following morning, she discovered a big bag of groceries on her front porch. Praise the Lord, she shouted. Suddenly, her neighbor jumped up from behind the bush. I told you there was no, there was no Lord. I brought those groceries for you. Praise the Lord, the woman said. He's not only sent me groceries, he made the devil pay for them. What can make your faith contagious? Relying upon God's provision for your deepest needs. You have problems, you have needs, you have challenges. We all might admit that. Have we put our faith in God's divine provision for our deepest needs? God provided for Saint No Name, Abraham's servant, when he practiced the faith of Abraham. Ask God directly to help him find a wife for Isaac. A very big task, a seemingly impossible task, and yet God let Rebekah write to him. Now God might not always give us a response we want to our needs directly, but some of our deepest needs he's already met. Just like the servant took a wife from Abraham's family, God has taken someone from his family took him to the cross so that you and I could be part of his family. Paul really liked Abraham, speaks rather often highly of him. Romans 4.16, he says, For this reason is by faith, that it may be by grace with the result that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only those under the law, but those who have the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. Is your faith like that of Abraham? Is it contagious? But also is it resting in God's divine providence for your deepest needs? What makes your faith contagious? A faith that others are intrigued by. It's a faith that is reliant upon God's divine providence for our deepest needs. You say, how can I have a faith like Abraham? And the answer is, I don't know if any of us can have an exact faith like Abraham. Even Paul thought so highly of it. He knew how remarkable his faith was. But the point here is not to imitate Abraham, but to put our faith in God who has provided for our deepest needs. God has provided his son. God promised to bless all nations through Abraham and his faith. You and I can have a faith that is contagious when we seek to rely upon God for our deepest needs. Live a life that others are drawn closer to God because of our relationship with him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, what is contagious faith? As we see the faith of this servant of Abraham, we realize it's a faith that provides, seeks to live off your provision <coughs> for our deepest needs. Gracious Lord, you have already provided for the deepest need that we have in Christ Jesus who died for us so that we can spend eternity with you. What grace what love, what hope. And yet, Lord, you still want to provide for us each and every day. Help us to look to you as this servant, Saint No Name, looks to you to provide his, for his deepest needs. Gracious Lord, help us to look to you as a God who provides in the world in which we live. It's your name that I pray. Amen.